Hello, good morning, good morning. Oh, wet, 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 wet. More rain forecast. We're turning into water world. Let me turn that fan off because that fan noise is a problem on this. <coughs> I have got a Lavalier mic, I'm gonna have to dig it out. It's not radio, it's not a Wi-Fi one, it's just a plug-in one, but fortunately this Pixel 4a has got a 3.5mm, oh that's a microphone jack isn't it? It's not a mic jack. Let me just uh, pull my windows in, might save me 30 quid, having to replace a wing mirror. How are you? All right? Good. Another lovely day in paradise. I uh, fed up to the back teeth with COVID now. Had a chat with a couple of friends of mine who are sort of uh, under house arrest, you know. They're still at the stage where they don't touch the post for 24 hours and spray it all and spray everyone who comes in and spray each other. So, but they both had one vaccine now, but it doesn't seem to have made much difference. I think they, one of them in particular, is going to spend the rest of their life locked up, really. But, uh, you know, there's a big debate at the moment about when we're going to get back to anything like normal, everything's still shut. We're all still on lockdown. I'm going to work because it's an essential service. Uh, most of the patients I'm seeing, funnily enough, are new patients, you know. They're, uh, we're, we're existing on the new business and dentistry's always been like that. It's, whenever there's been a demand side shock uh, for services, dentistry always tends to get through it because um, people always get toothache and teeth always break, grounds always fall out dentures always fracture so uh, uh, that's why I think from the bank's point of view dentistry is quite a good risk for lending you know because you're you've got a business that is providing it's not too highly leveraged uh, it's going to be uh, uh, pretty pretty uh, reliable in that it'll have the money uh, should push come to shove to pay pay the loan back you know without uh, without going through months where we, you know you've got no income at all perhaps like a restaurant or a cinema or whatever anyway uh, we've we've got this ridiculous situation where uh, we got off on the wrong foot really with covid and i think started doing things back to front and now uh, there's a big argument about who should get the vaccine. And of course the vaccine is the hot ticket now. Uh, if you want to, uh, you can't, because you can't buy the vaccine. I'm sure you can unofficially on the quiet. But um, because the job's been handed over to the National Health Service, and uh, they're tending to use their distribution, uh, which does mean that uh, they, they are keeping quite a tight. Uh, lid on the supply but well, we had a bit of a result yesterday local children's home said that they'd uh, you know they got far more PPE than they could use and so um, they dropped around six boxes of uh, aprons and um, masks and uh, visors which is nice of them they said they tried to tell the NHS they don't want any more, but the NHS wasn't taking any notice and just carried on delivering. So, you know, that's the NHS I know and love. That's the NHS. That's not the NHS that comes out and greets you with a clipboard and directs you to the right place and someone else takes over and puts you on the end of the correct queue and you actually get straight in and, and get what you wanted done. Well, with free parking, that's not... That NHS was very temporary. That was my vaccination experience. You know, if you 
if you disregard the fact that they sent me on a two hour wild goose chase uh, for a vaccine that uh, was never delivered to the site and therefore every appointment had to be cancelled and rescheduled for 8 o'clock that evening but I'll, I'll forgive them that you know that's a one off I'll just, I'll just give them a pass so um, there's a big debate at the moment about whether or not um, what should happen to people who for various reasons either can't get the vaccine can't have the vaccine or don't want the vaccine and uh, it's divided into two groups those who think that they should uh, uh, spend the rest of their life under house arrest chained to a toilet and uh, the younger generation who say you know we don't uh, we're, we're at very low risk and the vast majority of people who have covid have no symptoms at all don't even know they've had it for the most part and of those who who do get get it symptomatically the vast majority uh, will survive it uh, especially as treatment gets better and um, there was a big debate on uh, ITV which is the commercial channel yesterday on uh, which was really being hosted by and I say when I say hosted I mean they'll use the word loosely because hosted on television now it does not mean an interviewer probing uh, asking questions based on an intelligent understanding of the topic and trying to trying to elicit a response from the guest. Hosting really means uh, knowing what the channel's point of view is, what the channel narrative is, and uh, asking questions which are a minute or two minutes long and which contain a complete narrative and, and inviting the guests to agree uh, that that is the case. Um, and... Uh, it's, you know, the, the woman who was hosting it was uh, very famously, her husband is in a coma and has been for the best part of a year probably because he got COVID and he, and he got brain damage, I presume. He got very uh, poorly oxygenated at one point and it damaged his brain. And so she is, I would argue, in not in a good position to... Uh, host a debate on, on, on the subject she's too heavily invested in it There's, she's conflicted and I've you know, I've been concerned about this in the past where someone whose son is stabbed for example is held up as an expert on youth violence or uh, someone whose daughter died of a severe allergy is asked to spear spearhead a, a task force on uh, allergies, food allergies and um, there, there's all sorts of examples of this um, you know someone whose uh, s a sibling for example committed suicide will be held up as an expert on suicide um, and it's not because they didn't see that their sibling was going to commit suicide I, I have a problem with that because you know you can't for the most part you don't know people don't say oh by the way cheerio I'm going to commit suicide usually their last day is quite normal they just talk to everybody and then and then they snap and that's it but it's because that job should be a meritocratic, meritocratic appointment it should be given to the person who's best for the job and I would imagine in every case that I've quoted someone who may have been the best for the job has lost out on the job because they haven't had a child who died from an allergy or was stabbed or committed suicide or uh, is in coma is in a coma in hospital with COVID uh, they are not the, these are not the best people to um, uh, and certainly that's not the best way to conduct an interview uh, and they should they should say they should describe it for what it is, which is um, editorial. They should say, now we're going to come to our editorial section where uh, GMTV is going to uh, uh, debate with uh, some people who basically agree with us about why our, our, uh, the, the company line is the correct line to take. And that really does annoy me, and that's why uh, 
the BBC, for example, that does a lot of this as well, is now being criticised and there's a big campaign to defund the BBC and decriminalise non-payment of the licence so that uh, you can sort of not pay and then the worst that can happen to you is you you get uh, taken to small claims court and have to pay the licence and another 30 quid interest on top or whatever. So, so th this debate of course is uh, only come about because of earlier decisions that were taken incorrectly. Um, and you quite frequently find that, and you certainly do find that in the public sector, that uh, a, a seemingly, I wouldn't say unimportant, because to the people who understand these things, the early decision that's made wrong is important. It's, it's a crucial decision. And it's a crucial decision that, <clears throat> you know, doesn't seem to, uh, you know, it seems to be able to go either way, but it's, it's crucial for the functioning of everything else around it that it does go a certain way and when it doesn't go the, the, the correct way then uh, everything around it then uh, later on starts to fall apart so you know for example uh, whether or not Bitcoin should be classified as a, a commodity or a money or a new uh, asset class which exhibits the properties of both a commodity and the money, which is my personal favourite. I think it can be treated as either, but the uh, government's come down very clearly on against it being a money and in favour of it being a commodity, and that is going to cause a lot of trouble later on, because, you know, uh, because when it's acting like a money and being used like a money and being treated like a commodity, like for example in America, uh, every time you spend a pound on something using Bitcoin, you have to say when you bought that Bitcoin and how much it's appreciated in time since, and pay capital gains tax on the on the uh, <laughs> difference between the disposal and the acquisition price. You know, and this is obviously patently ridiculous. You know, when it's being used as a money, and it's, it was the same with. Um, this idea that uh, every other disease that we've had up to now, it's been up to you to protect yourself from the disease. You get yourself vaccinated, that protects you, or you stay indoors, that protects you, or you uh, avoid going abroad to anywhere where this disease is, is active, that protects you. Um, and for the first time, we've come, we've had a disease where uh, it's. Uh, it's now, it's now everybody else's responsibility to protect you, right? That's a complete vault fast, a complete backwardation of the whole thing, where now, uh, you know, nobody's safe. So long as one person hasn't been vaccinated, nobody's safe. Um, and this is a, a piece of patently ridiculous and goes against everything we know and all uh, human experience with diseases. Um, people must be allowed to adopt their own risk profile and say what, what risk they're prepared to accept. And uh, if you are particularly worried uh, or in a vulnerable group, then you either shield, you stay at home, or you uh, wear a mask that uh, stops you getting it, or you get vaccinated, <coughs> which should stop you getting it. <coughs> but you don't go round telling everybody that they have to they have to be vaccinated or else they're going to be locked in their bathroom chained to the toilet um, it's absolutely and and I can trace this back you know this is not like uh, this is not a characteristic of the disease this is not like a, because this is just a, 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 a SARS uh, disease it's not anything out of the ordinary in terms of other than it being new um, it's not anything out of the ordinary in terms of uh, viruses, you know. Um, it's not like uh, like when prions came along. Prions were a, a totally different thing, like from outer space, and we had to understand what prions were. Uh, so we had uh, first of all we didn't know about bacteria, then we knew about bacteria, but not about viruses, and then we learned about viruses, so we knew about bacteria and viruses, but not prions, 
and then along comes the BSE prion. So we, we have to understand that the humans can be affected by um, by a molecule that's that's really just a malevolent molecule, you know, not even a uh, a living uh, a living thing as far as we we can define living. So this this uh, virus is just a virus, okay, and but we're not treating it in the way that we've treated other viruses. We are, we've de developed this sort of back to front approach, and um, I think it started when. Um, I can trace it back to the early days when there was a severe lack of um, PPE, uh, protective personal equipment. And what happened was there was uh, there were very few masks. I mean, obviously, dentists had them because we had them anyway. But um, the, there are two levels of masks. There's the level two mask, which um, are, you know they argue stops you giving it to people. It doesn't. It just stops you coughing directly on people. Um, I don't think for a minute it. Uh, it seriously reduces the um, your infectivity. Um, then you've got the level three mask, the PPE three, um, which is the one that's very tight fitting and where you have to suck all your air in and suck blow all your air out through the mask, and it's got a 98% filtration level for virus particles, and that's the one that stops you getting it. Yeah. So anyone who's um, complaining that other people aren't wearing masks. Are, are not thinking straight. What they should do is they should wear a level three mask that stops them getting it, and then everyone else to a large extent can do what they like. They can wear level three, level two, or nothing at all. Because you're behind a level three mask, you don't care. So, but there were no level three masks in the early days. So what happened was, uh, everybody had to wear, the, mo the best they could do was a level two mask, and um, so they said to everybody, you know, you've got to wear a level two mask. And the idea of that is just, they couldn't say it stops you getting it, but they did say that it stopped you giving it to anyone. And so this whole idea about it, you know, our reaction to this virus was it needed to be backwards because we had to uh, take responsibility for everybody else and stop, uh, and stop and stop giving it to everybody, I think was um, the origin of the, uh, you know, the, the, the current panic over the fact that everybody needs to have a vaccine and it's not until the last person's had the vaccine that, that we can breathe a sigh of relief. And it's causing a lot of hate against the people who are trying to put that point of view, you know, trying to say that's an unreasonable uh, model. You know, that's an unreasonable uh, thing to aim for. Um, and of course, as I say, and it's being, uh, you know, it was spearheaded yesterday by by the woman whose husband's in a coma. So you can't really expect her to have a lot of sympathy for anyone who comes on the television and says, um, you know, we, we should have the freedom not to vaccinate ourselves if we don't want to. And, and it was said by a woman who was, quite young quite and quite well argued the point but um, and did say that you know if she was offered the vaccine she would have it she didn't have a problem with it she just doesn't agree with locking everybody up <laughs> if they won't have it or you know decide not to have it and I've got to say I'm completely with her you know I am completely with her on that so So I don't know, um, you know, because, and this goes back to my original point, was where, where one bad decision, right? One bad decision, which is to say that the treatment of this disease or the containment of this disease depends on the successful elimination of, of anybody in your, you know, who might be giving it away, rather than the successful protection of anybody who might get it. That decision, forced on us really by the shortage of level three masks in the early days, um, has now morphed into the far more stupid uh, contention that in the same way as everybody need, needed to wear a mask, that everybody now needs to get a vaccination or, um, or you're a granny killer. 
and the solution was really um, the solution was in the early days when the level 3 masks became available the government should have said look uh, we're, we're changing policy now we're shifting from a policy of don't give it away to don't get it and so now uh, you know rather than advising you to wear a level 2 mask we are advising you to wear a level 3 mask if you can um, and if they'd done that then there wouldn't be so much fuzzled, fuzzy thinking you know confused thinking on the whole thing my windscreen's steaming up and the problem is I can't unsteam it without causing a load of background noise which is annoying so you can either can't hear me or you can't see out the window but, um, but it's important because I think um, if we carry on with this you know and we're not safe until the last person has been vaccinated then what's going to happen is that we are never going to be safe and you've got the other you know the other questions which arise so easily to anyone who's thinking about this which is um, if you need to prove that you've been vaccinated to get on a plane what vaccines are they going to say that you need I mean we used to quite happily get on a plane and you could be sitting next to someone who hadn't been vaccinated with smallpox or you could be sitting next to someone who hadn't been vaccinated for uh, measles, mumps and rubella or tuberculosis or you could be sitting next to someone who got active hepatitis C which is infectious and for which there's no uh, no vaccine or HIV for which there's no vaccine uh, which is not particularly infectious but I mean you get my point I mean my point is these people have not got the brains to think ahead even a week as to what's going to happen if they introduce a policy of, you know, you have to have a vaccine certificate for COVID to get on a plane. Because it then makes sense, logically, to say that you've got to have a COVID, you've got to have a, a, a series of vaccines, you've got, to have, you've got to have been vaccinated against all the, the more common, easily transmissible diseases. And the best way to um, to keep a record of that would be to have a page in your passport which was basically just filled in by your GP every time you were vaccinated. In other words, a vaccine passport. It's it's inevitable. And uh, you're, you know, you wouldn't need that for internal travel. I mean, in Europe, you need a passport for internal travel anyway. But in the UK, where you don't need a passport, providing you're in the UK, you tend to be able to move around fairly freely. Uh, you certainly don't need a passport. Um, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. You know, if you got on a bus, you would have to rely on the fact that you'd been vaccinated and that perhaps you were wearing a level 3 mask and therefore you're completely comfortable with that level of risk. You might not even want to wear a mask, you know, and just go back to the old days. Um, but you shouldn't be shouted at <laughs> if you're not wearing a mask by some old twit who's like, you know, you're, are you trying to kill me? Aren't you, why aren't you wearing a mask? Are you trying to kill me? Sort of thing. It's just, uh, the, the thinking is not coherent, it's not logical, and it's the whole thing is just a complete uh, mess. Anyway, what you have to do is you have to act, uh, you have to work reactively, don't you? You have to sort of hop from lily pad to lily pad just uh, being defensive and uh, working out what you can do um, sometimes what you can get away with so so that's where we are in terms of the public hysteria by by no means over and uh, life by no means back to normal and a lot of people I think um, you know who don't care uh, more than happy to extend lockdown for months or even years, you know, 
like my friend who I don't right might never leave the house again, you know, for all I know. Alright, okay. Sorry it's not a happy one today. But um, you know, food for thought. I'll um, talk to you next time. Bye. <laughs>